Hello friends, myself Dr. Anurag Tiwari and today through this video I am going to teach you developmental dysplasia of hip joint. So let's start the topic. So developmental dysplasia of hip, the older term was congenital dislocation of hip or CDH. But nowadays it has been replaced by DDH that is a developmental dysplasia of hip. Basically the problem is defective development of the hip joint. So it includes all the disorders that affect the normal development of the hip joint which causes increase in the joint laxity and as a result of which head moves out of the acetabulum and there is a failure to maintain this reduction. So this is the main pathophysiology behind DDH. Let's understand that what are the causes of DDH. Various hypotheses has been given and out of these the certain hypotheses which are important just discuss them. The first and the most important is the ligamentous laxity. It has been seen that those patients who have generalized laxity disorder are more prone to develop DDH. Now how to detect this generalized laxity is with the help of a criteria that is Vinay Davis criteria. In this criteria there are five parameters to check the generalized joint laxity. These parameters are the thumb to forearm. If the patient is able to touch the thumb to his or her forearm if he or she can extend the finger almost parallel to the forearm, if the elbow hyperextension is more than 15 degree, if the knee hyperextension is more than 15 degree and the ankle dorsiflexion more than 60 degree. So these parameters or these points will decide that which patient will have generalized laxity disorder and as a result of which they are more prone to develop DTH. Next factor is the prenatal factor. The prenatal factors it includes the breech presentation and oligohydramnios. So if the child is breech presentation or the mother is having oligohydramnios, then they will develop DDH. Also the DDH is associated with certain conditions like metatarsus adductus and torticollis. The third factor is the postnatal factor which is decided by hip positioning postnatally. So it has been seen in western countries the child is kept with hips in extension and adduction as a result of which there is more chances of developing DDH because in adduction and extension the hip joint development do not take place normally. However, in India there is a low incidence of DDH because the hips are kept in abduction and flexion like we see in this picture. The last and the most important is a primary failure of acetabulum development. So when there is a defective development of the acetabulum, the acetabulum is not able to keep the head of the femur inside its socket. So hip joint gets dislocated. Next we talk about the risk factors for DDH. What are the risk factors that are associated to develop DDH? The first is the first born child in the family will have a risk of DDH. Next is the female gender. If the child is a female, because of the maternal hormone relaxin which crosses the placenta as a result of which there is generalized laxity. So that's why females have more chances to develop TDH because females are more sensitive to maternal hormone relaxing. Another is the foot first presentation when there is a breech presentation as already told you the child will develop TDH. If the family history is positive it is more common in western countries so foreigner have a more chances as compared to Indian and the fluid is low that is the oligohydramnios. And the last is the left joint is more common than the right hip joint. However, this is not a risk factor but just this is included because all these risk factors have F letter in common to remember the risk factors. So left is more common than the right hip involvement. Next we talk about the pathogenesis. The common etiology is the poor development of the hip joint as a result of which the head moves out of the acetabulum. And once the head is out of the acetabulum, with time there will be secondary changes that develop and these secondary changes can be intra-articular or extra-articular. The extra-articular are mainly the muscles which are present around the hip joint that is the adductors and the iliosoas. The adductor and iliosoas get shortened and contracted as a result these are the changes which develop in a DDH. Similarly, in the intra-articular, if we talk about, there is a hypertrophy of the pulvinar fat. The pulvinar is the soft tissue which is present in the floor of the acetabulum. 
So when the acetabulum is vacant because head is not in the acetabulum, the pulvinar fat will get hypertrophied. Second, the ligamentum teres which is connecting the acetabulum to the head of the femur phobia, it will get hypertrophied and thickened and lengthened because of the dislocation. Third is the transverse acetabular ligament also known as TAL will get thickened. This is the ligament which is present in the inferior aspect of the acetabulum. So once again when the acetabulum is empty, the TAL will get hypertrophied similarly to the pulvinar fat. Next is the, there will be hourglass thickening of the inferior joint capsule. There will be inverted labrum, femoral head flattening and increased femur antiversion. So these all intraarticular as well as the extraarticular factors, they combine and these are the obstacles to close reduction. When a child of a DDH, we are not able to reduce. It is because of these obstacles, these factors which hinder the reduction of a DDH. Next, we talk about certain definitions which are important in the DDH case. We talk about dysplasia. The dysplasia is basically increase in the obliquity and loss of concavity of acetabulum with intact Shenton's line. So mainly the acetabulum is actually not so horizontal, it is more vertical because of the increase in the obliquity as a result of which the head is not getting contained inside the acetabulum. Next, when there is a subluxation, the femoral head is not in full contact. There is some partial contact with the acetabulum and there will be break in the Shenton's line. What is Shenton's line? We will talk in a later slides. The dislocation, when there is a complete uh, dislocation, the head is completely out of the socket and head is not in contact with the acetabulum, there will be break in Shenton's line. And the teratological dislocation is dislocation since birth and it is irreducible. We are not able to reduce the joint. It is most likely seen in certain syndromes and myelomeningocele. Next, we talk about the clinical features of DDH. So, most important, the clinical features of DDH are according to the age of the patient. So, if the child is neonate, there will be different signs and symptoms. If the child is infant, there will be different. And if the child is of walking age group, they will be different. First, we talk about the signs in neonate. The two most important tests are Barlow and Otolani. The Barlow test is the test of dislocation. We need to dislocate the hip joint by doing adduction of the hip. When we adduct the thigh, there will be dislocation and a palpable clunk can be heard. Otolani is just opposite of Barlow test. It is the reduction of the hip by doing abduction. When we abduct the thigh, the hip will get reduced and a sound we can here that is the sound of reduction. So these are the Barlow test. In Barlow test we are doing adduction and in the Otolani test we are doing abduction. So the Otolani is doing the reduction of the hip you can see here whereas the Barlow test is for dislocation it is dislocating the hip. So these two tests will judge about the stability of the hip joint. They basically detect hip instability whether the hip is instable, unstable or not. The next sign in the infant is classic sign. The classic sign is you place your middle finger over the GT, you place your tip of index finger over the ASIS. When you join, this line should pass through the umbilicus in a normal limb or normal child. Whereas in DDH, because the greater trochanter will move upward because of the dislocation, this line will pass below umbilicus and that is the classic sign is positive that is suggestive of DDH. Next, we talk about the signs in infant. In infant, the Barlow, Otolani and Clisic sign will be positive. In addition, there will be certain other signs like this. There will be asymmetrical thigh fold. If you see carefully, there are asymmetry in the thigh fold on the right and the left. Next is there will be decrease in the abduction. On the right side, if you see the full abduction is from 0 to 40 degree, whereas on the left side, it is from 0 to 80 degree. So the right side is having decrease in the abduction range of motion that is suggestive of DDH and another sign very important that is Galeazi sign or also known as Ellie's sign that is when the child is placed we place the child supine with knee and hip flexed and you can see easily that this limb is shortened than this side so that means this is abnormal or DDH whereas this is normal because there is shortening on this side. Next is the, we see the signs in the walking child. So walking child is all different because here 
the Bardlo and Otolani test will be negative. We will not be able to dislocate as well as we will not be able to reduce the dislocated hip because the child is uh, now of older age group and the soft tissue contracture and because of tightness of the ligament we are not able to reduce the hip joint. So the other signs will be there will be prolonged profound shortening, there will be Trendelenburg sign, Trendelenburg gait and if it is bilateral DDS there will be Wedling gait. So these are all the clinical features, the Barlow, Otolani and Klesik will be positive up to the infant age group. Whereas in walking child, the Barlow and Otolani will be negative. As I have already told you why these are negative in a walking child. Whereas the shortening Trendelenburg gait and Trendelenburg test are of a walking age group, they will be positive in a walking child. Next we talk about the important radiological features in a case of DDH. This is the important topic because on the basis of x-ray we can diagnose the DDH. It is difficult to diagnose because the most of the femoral head is made up of cartilage and it is not visible on x-ray. So we see that this is a x-ray of a child. The first line is the Hilgenriener's line. So we draw one particular line that is Hilgenriener and Hilgenriener is actually horizontal line H for H. You can remember that Hilgenriener is a horizontal line that is passing through triradiate cartilage of both the sides. These are the triradiate cartilage. So this line will pass through these two points. So this is Hilgenriener's line. Another line is a Perkins line which is perpendicular to Hilgenriener's line and it is passing through the edge of the acetabulum. So this is the Perkins line. Now on the basis of these two lines there are four quadrants. So superolateral, superomedial, infrolateral and inferomedial. So if you see carefully that the femoral epiphysis on this side is lying in the inferomedial quadrant and it is normal. Whereas if it is lying in the inferolateral, it will be subluxation and if it is lying in the superolateral, it will be dislocation. Now see the affected side, this side you see the femoral epiphysis is lying in this quadrant and this quadrant is superolateral. That means it is dislocation. It is a clear cut case of developmental dysplasia of hip joint. Next we talk about the Shenton's line. We were talking in the previous slides that what is Shenton's line. The Shenton line on the affected side, on the normal side, if we draw, it is passing through the inframedial aspect of the neck and head and through the inferior aspect of the superior pubic ramus. So this is the continuous imaginary line, smooth. On the right side it is normal. Whereas on the affected side if you try to draw, you will likely draw like this and it is appearing to be broken. So this is the Shenton's line is broken on the affected side in a case of DDH. Next we talk about the femoral epiphysis size. Now this is the size of femoral epiphysis on the right side. Whereas on the affected side it is smaller in size. You can easily compare, easily appreciate that this size is larger than this. So there is delayed ossification of the femoral epiphysis and it appears to be smaller in size in case of DDH. Next is if you see the teardrop, the teardrop on the affected side on the normal side will be normal. However, in the affected side it can be absent, V-shaped or wider. So this is the teardrop in DDH. Now you see this part of the bone is the ileum. This ileum on the affected side appears to be smaller as compared to the right side. So this bone is larger, however there are subtle differences, but this bone is smaller in size that is known as hypoplastic ileum. So the ileum hypoplasia is another radiological sign of DDH. Next we talk about the estabular index, another important component in the DDH. We draw the Hilgenriener's line and we draw another line passing through the slope of the estabulum. Basically it is showing the slope of the estabulum and you measure this angle. On the affected side this angle. So it seems that this angle is more as compared to this side. So this is estabular index. So this is suggesting the more the angle that means it is more vertical. The estabulum is more vertical on the affected side. So these are the normal values. You remember that at any age group it should be less than 30 degree. If it is more than 30 degree, it is abnormal, it is suggestive of DDH. That means the estabulum is not normal, it is dysplastic. So that is the importance of estabular index. 
नेक्स्ट एंगल इज सेंटर एज एंगल द सेंटर एज एंगल एज द नेम सजेस्ट इट इज फ्रॉम द सेंटर ऑफ द हेड टू द एज ऑफ द एस्टाबुलम सो यू ड्रॉ द पर्किस लाइन दैट इज पासिंग थ्रू द एज ऑफ द एस्टाबुलम एंड यू ड्रॉ अनादर लाइन पासिंग थ्रू द सेंटर ऑफ द हेड टू द एज सो दिस एंगल इज सी ई एंगल और सेंटर एज एंगल ऑन द एफेक्टेड साइड इट इज दिस एंगल दिस एज क्रॉस फ्रॉम द मीडियल टू द लेटरल साइड हावर इट शुड बी ऑन द मीडियल साइड इफ द हेड वॉज इन द मीडियल और इज ऑन द नॉर्मल प्लेस सो दिस एंगल द नॉर्मल वैल्यूज आर इन फ्रॉम सिक्स टू थर्टीन ईयर ऑफ एज ग्रुप इट इज मोर देन नाइनटीन डिग्री एंड फ्रॉम फोर्टीन मोर देन फोर्टीन ईयर्स ऑफ एज ग्रुप इट शुड बी मोर देन ट्वेंटी फाइव डिग्री एनी डिक्रीज इन एंगल और चेंज टू द अपोजिट साइड इज एब नॉर्मल दैट इज सजेस्टिव ऑफ डी डी एच नेक्स्ट व्यू इज अ स्पेशल व्यू दैट इज अ वोन रोजन व्यू इट इज टेकन विद फोर्टी फाइव डिग्री ऑफ एबडक्शन एंड इंटरनल रोटेशन ऑल्सो नोन एज एबडक्शन इंटरनल रोटेशन व्यू इन दिस व्यू इफ यू सी ऑन द नॉर्मल साइड द लाइन पासिंग थ्रू द फीमोरल मिड पॉइंट और द फीमोरल एनाटमिकल एक्सेज विल पास थ्रू द एस्टाबुलम वेर एज ऑन द एब नॉर्मल इफ द चाइल्ड इज हैविंग डी डी एच देर इज डिस लोकेशन द फीमोरल एनाटोमिकल एक्सेज विल पास सुपीरियर टू एस्टाबुलम सो दिस इज द एस्टाबुलम एंड यू कैन सी इट इज पासिंग अवे फ्रॉम द एस्टाबुलम दैट इज सजेस्टिव ऑफ डिस लोकेशन और डी डी एच नाउ वी टॉक अबाउट द स्क्रीनिंग ऑफ द चिल्ड्रन फॉर डी डी एच सो इफ आई आस्क यू डेट वॉट ऑल चिल्ड्रन नीड्स स्क्रीनिंग द आंसर वुड बी ऑल न्यू नेट शुड हैव द स्क्रीनिंग टेस्ट बाय क्लिनिकल एग्जामिनेशन सो द क्लिनिकल एग्जामिनेशन इज इम्पॉर्टेंट वी हैव टॉक्ड अबाउट इन द प्रीवियस सेक्शन दैट इज ओटोलानी एंड बार्लो टेस्ट सो यू विल डू ओटोलानी एंड बार्लो इन ईच एंड एवरी न्यू बॉर्न चाइल्ड वंस द ओटोलानी एंड बार्लो आर पॉजिटिव इन अ केस यू विल डू यू एस जी और इफ देर आर सर्टिन रिस्क फैक्टर्स पॉजिटिव देन यू विल डू यू एस जी सो द इंडिकेशन ऑफ यू एस जी स्क्रीनिंग इज पॉजिटिव ओटोलानी एंड बार्लो टेस्ट एंड द प्रजेंस ऑफ रिस्क फैक्टर्स ना वॉट आर दीज रिस्क फैक्टर्स वी टॉक इन नेक्स्ट सेक्शन द रिस्क फैक्टर्स कुड बी एंटी नेटल दैट इज प्री नेटल और पोस्ट नेटल इफ द चाइल्ड इज हैविंग ब्रीच प्रजेंटेशन इफ देर इज अ फैमिली हिस्ट्री पॉजिटिव और इफ देर इज ऑलिगोहाइड्रिमनियोस पोस्ट नेटल इफ द चाइल्ड इज हैविंग टॉटिकोलिस और मेटाटार्स अडक्टर्स इन दीज फैक्टर्स यू विल डेफिनेटली गेट यू एस जी स्क्रीनिंग टू रूल आउट डी डी एच सो यू एस जी बेस्ड क्लासिफिकेशन वॉज गिवन बाय ग्राफ ऑफ ऑस्ट्रिया ही डिवाइडेड द डी डी एच इन टू फोर क्लासेज वन टू थ्री एंड फोर द वन इज द नॉर्मल वेर एज द फोर इज सीवियर वेराइटी कंप्लीट डिसलोकेशन सो ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ अल्फा एंगल एंड बीटा एंगल ही डिवाइज दिस क्लासिफिकेशन Now, what are these alpha angle and beta angle? Just remember that alpha angle is the bony angle, and the beta angle is soft tissue angle. So, for a normal child, we need the head of the femur should be well covered by the bony acetabulum. More and more bony should be there. So, if there is more bone, the alpha angle will be high in a normal child. Whereas in a DDH, the alpha angle will be low. The opposite is with the beta angle. Since the beta angle is a soft tissue angle, so in a normal child the beta angle will be low, and in a DDS the beta angle will be high. Because once there is a dislocation, now the head is covered by soft tissue. So it is complete dislocation. The beta angle will increase. So this is the picture of the USG. This is the line of ilium. This is the line of the uh, soft tissue, and this is the line of the bony acetabulum. so this angle is the beta this angle is the alpha and this is the femoral head so if the femoral head is more covered by the soft tissue the beta angle will be the beta angle will be more so beta angle increases it means it is ddh beta angle decreases it is normal so this is the basic classification usg based this is given by graph and is still it is used by radiologist today next we talk about the last section of this video that is the treatment from birth to 6 months we will use pelvic harness so pelvic harness is basically a type of a brace which we apply to the child and the the brace will do flexion and abduction basically the brace we need to keep the hip flexion flexed and abducted as a result the hip will get reduced in the joint in the socket of the acetabulum and the normal development can take place from 6 months to 18 months 
we will do the reduction of the joint either the close or open reduction plus or minus k wire fixation along with hip spica is been given beyond 18 months it is very difficult to achieve reduction either close or open so we will require certain special procedure that are osteotomy so osteotomy could be pelvic osteotomy or femoral osteotomy from 0 to 6 months it is the pelvic harness the pelvic harness we keep the free flexion from 90 to 120 degree and the abduction is free this is important we do not do any forced abduction because by doing forced abduction we can have avn or avascular necrosis of the femoral head certain complications as i have already told you that is the avn of the femoral head failure to reduce that is a failure of pelvic harness if there is increase in the more of a flexion the child will develop femoral nerve neuropathy or inferior hip dislocation and the pelvic disease is the flattening of the posterolateral acetabulum again because of the increased pressure from the femoral head to the acetabulum. Certain contraindications of pelvic harness is the teratological dislocation that is if the dislocation is irreducible syndromic then the pelvic harness is not going to do anything and if the child is of crawling age then the pelvic harness will not work the flexion and abduction will not be able to achieve in a crawling age group. So it is these are the contraindication and these are the complications of pelvic harness. From 6 months to 18 months it is the reduction plus or minus adductor tenotomy plus hip spica. So the reduction we do under C arm guidance by doing arthrography. It is very important because the normal child will have femoral head mostly made up of cartilage and we are not going to see cartilage on x-ray on C arm. So what we do, we inject the dye into the hip joint and then we take the x-rays to assess the joint with the help of um, dye that is known as arthrography. The most important factor of reduction is the quality of reduction. This is important. The quality of reduction, we should have a wide safe zone. The safe zone concept was given by Ramsey. If the range of motion in which the hip remains reduced, that is known as the safe zone. Next we talk about the treatment in more than 18 months we will do osteotomy. Now which osteotomy to do is decided on the basis of a x-ray abduction and internal rotation view. We will take a x-ray with full abduction and full internal rotation and then we see that whether the hip is concentrically being reduced. If the hip is concentrically being reduced we will do redirectional osteotomy. If it is not we will do salvage procedures. So what are these redirectional osteotomies? They include the Salter innominate osteotomy, Pumberton osteotomy, steel triple innominate osteotomy and Gans osteotomy. There are various other osteotomies too but however I have only mentioned these four because these are more important. Out of these, the Salter and the Pumberton are the most important. You should know about Salter and Pumberton definitely. In salvage procedure, we have the two procedure that is the self procedure and the KRE osteotomy. So these two are important in a salvage group. Let's talk about Salter osteotomy. So this is a innominate bone or the hemipelvis. This is the estabulum. So we do osteotomy from AIIS that is anterior inferior iliac spine that is this point to sciatic notch. So this is sciatic notch. So the osteotomy will go from AIIS to sciatic notch. We cut the bone and we rotate the inferior aspect by 10 to 15 degree. How much of the correction do we require? How much of this is the estabular index or how much is the dysplasia present in a, that particular patient? Next we take the bone graft from the iliac crest and we insert at the osteotomy site and we fix it with two K wires. So in this way we have changed the direction of the estabulum. Now you can see that direction, the osteotomy, after osteotomy. Now this is the estabulum and this is the pre-op. In pre-op you can see that the estabulum is facing almost horizontal whereas in this case it is somewhat looking inferior. So then this way by doing this osteotomy and rotating the fragment we have changed the direction of the estabulum. So that's why it is known as redirectional osteotomy. This is Salter's osteotomy. So just a few words about the Salter osteotomy. The main objective is to increase the coverage of the femoral head. The osteotomy is from the AIIS that is anterior inferior iliac spine to sciatic notch. 
fulcrum is the pubic symphysis on which we are doing the rotation the age group in which we can do is from 18 months to 6 years in beyond 6 years it is not advisable to do salter osteotomy because pubic symphysis now become more rigid and we will not be able to achieve particular correction in this age group and the prerequisite is concentric hip reduction as i have already told you that when you get concentric hip reduction you will do redirectional procedures otherwise salvage and if the hip joint has a good range of motion then only you will do the salter osteotomy next we talk about the pemberton osteotomy we have added this pelvis along with this we have added this triradiate cartilage the triradiate cartilage is there in the child up to 10 years of age group so let's talk about the pemberton's osteotomy in this the osteotomy level is from aiis to triradiate cartilage that is passing in a curvilinear fashion from aiis to triradiate cartilage so when we cut the bone through this portion it looks like this and when we rotate this by 10 to 15 degree this fragment will get closer to the acetabulum in this way you can see easily appreciate that we are reducing the volume of the acetabulum the acetabulum here is this much whereas in this case it is looking much smaller because of the osteotomy and rotating this fragment towards the acetabulum socket so in this way it is doing distortion to the acetabulum cavity and reducing the volume of the acetabulum next we can take the bone graft from the iliac crest and we insert it to the osteotomy site however there is no need to fix this because this is more stable type of osteotomy so there is no fixation is required as compared to the salter osteotomy where we need to fix it with a k wire next the damage to neurovascular structure is minimal because the neurovascular structures are lying in the sciatic notch here the neurovascular structures are lying we are not going towards the sciatic notch as we go in salter osteotomy so in this osteotomy the minimal damage to the neurovascular structure there will be distortion to the acetabular cavity as i have already told you there will be growth disturbance because we are doing osteotomy to the triradiate cartilage so there will be some growth problem and it is more technically difficult as compared to salter osteotomy so this is a post-operative x-ray you can see that we have done the osteotomy towards the triradiate cartilage and then we rotated this fragment and beautifully now the head of the femur is well covered by this bone so few lines about the pemberton osteotomy the main objective is to decrease the acetabulum inclination the osteotomy level is from aiis to triradiate cartilage and the fulcrum here is triradiate cartilage that's why the triradiate cartilage fuses at about 10 years beyond 10 years we will not be able to do pemberton osteotomy and similarly the main prerequisite is triradiate cartilage should be open then only you can do pemberton osteotomy next osteotomy is a steel triple innominate osteotomy as the name suggests it is a triple innominate so we are doing three osteotomy on innominate bone let us see how this is the first osteotomy that is the supra acetabulum region just above the acetabulum <clears throat> this is the second osteotomy level that is the superior pubic ramus and this is the third that is the inferior pubic ramus once we have cut these bones we remove and now this fragment has become an independent fragment or we can say now this we can rotate it very well so we when we rotate it by 10 to 15 degree or by whatever amount the thing to appreciate is we have changed the inclination of the acetabulum initially it was more of a vertical type like this now the orientation is more of a horizontal type so in this way we can achieve more stability and more femoral head coverage we can also use k wire to fix these osteotomies so this provides better coverage to the femoral head better hip joint stability technically very difficult it distorts the hip such that the natural childbirth may be impossible in adulthood as you can see that we have changed the inner diameter of the pelvis so this can cause difficulty during the normal labor so that is the main disadvantage of this type of osteotomy so few lines about this osteotomy it is the main objective to correct the residual dysplasia there will be three osteotomies as i have already told you the age group is in the adult age group from late adolescent to skeletal maturity 
and the prerequisite is again concentric reduction and good range of motion. Next is the Gans osteotomy. If you see carefully, Gans and triple innominate is more or less the same type. Just see the differences. We take out this socket. This is the osteotomy level. We take out the osteotomy just almost along or uh, along the periphery of the estabulum. So when we cut this, this fragment is the estabulum. We have independently we can rotate. Now this is the situation. By this we can change the inclination of the estabulum in a three directional or a three dimensional manner. So just a few lines about the Gans osteotomy. It is to correct the residual dysplasia. It is a triplanar 3D osteotomy and the age group is it should be done in more than 8 years and the prerequisite is triradiate cartilage should be fused then only we can do this type of osteotomy. So next we talk about the salvage procedures when concentric reduction is not possible <clears throat> we will do self procedure or carry osteotomy. Now what are these? Let's understand first the self operation or also known as Staheli surgery or Staheli operation. In this procedure the surgeon take out certain osteoperiosteal flaps like this just in the bone superior to estabulum and they rotate these flaps towards the horizontal like this and with time now the femoral head is getting more coverage by these tissue and with time this will get converted to the bone and will merge with the estabulum. So in this way from estabulum this much we have increased the size of the estabulum to this one. So this is when we are not able to get concentric reduction the head of the femur is lying outside the estabulum suppose here and we can easily do this osteoperiosteal flaps and we can increase the coverage of the femoral head. So this is a post operative x-ray you can see here very well this is the extra shelf which we have created and this is providing extra coverage to the femoral head. Last is the Chiari osteotomy. Now the Chiari osteotomy is the osteotomy level is just above the estabulum that is the supra estabulum. We cut the bone here and we shift this part of the pelvis towards the medial side. In this way we have created an extra edge of the bone which will convert it to the bone and this will increase the estabulum. So that's why it is also known as the capsule interposition arthroplasty and the two K wires can be introduced through this osteotomy. So this is a capsule interposition arthroplasty it is another name for Chiari osteotomy and the advantage is it decreases the Trendel and Buglerge by increasing the lever arm because of the medial shift of the distal fragment the Trendel and Buglerge will also reduced. So this is a post operative x-ray you can see very well that the Chiari osteotomy has been done. Few lines about the Chiari osteotomy the main objective is to increase the head coverage the osteotomy level is the supra estabulum and the age group is in the more than 4 years below 4 years it is not to be done. Thank you.